Thank you very much, Rudy. I start getting red, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for the warm welcome. Thank you for being here. The next 25 minutes will be a look into what can be done with deep learning technology in a business context, in an industry context, based on applied research project we have been doing in my group in the last couple of months, couple of years. And I try to draw specific lessons learned that fill the gap between what we see in research papers and can read there and what is necessary to make it run when you want to make money out of it and run a business out of it. So let's look into it. Why are we here? Why are we talking about deep learning? You know all the, the scientific papers that are out there, the important ones in nature and science and all of the smaller ones. Um, these are just examples of the huge amount of re research we have seen in the last couple of years on deep learning technology, methodology, and applications. But in the end, we are talking about it because deep learning started to get practically applied, not just in, let's say, pilot projects where some big fancy internet company tries out some things, we all heard about these, but where it can be used by basically any business that has a pattern recognition use case. So we're talking about a method that is really mm. apt for applying as soon as you have some pattern recognition problem to, to work on. And we will look a little bit into that. We will look into it by means of three concrete examples we're doing with uh, companies, actually all smaller companies from the area here, um, and then draw some lessons learned from it. And you will find out what the, all the images mean by seeing the examples. So, um, I show you a quick video. I switched off the, um, the sound so I can talk over it and we save some time. It's a commercial by one of our project partners, uh, Deep Impact from Wintertour. They are building a face recognition, face verification application as part of, of a larger project they are doing. What is the software doing? In, in a live uh, feed, it uh, finds the face, so it does face detection. Then it asks the person to smile into the camera, takes a picture, asks the person to show the ID card, finds the, the uh, pass fo passport photo, and then does face verification, which basically means it, it gives you the um, good or not good if the two faces match, the one on the passport and the one in reality. This is, of course, just to look nice. This is not the way it is done. But while we're looking at it, can you give me some hints how you would approach it? Any ideas in the room? What, what would be some, some, some method, some technology to, to do this kind of stuff? You're not allowed to say. <laughs> Eli is from my group. One of the simplest to start with some kind of translation of the services and then... You could do stuff like that, exactly. And you could try to go from there to simpler and then more sophisticated deep learning models. And maybe the one or other has in mind that I think Google produced a paper two years ago called the FaceNet. 
um, <coughs> that basically does exactly that trick. It, you give it a picture of a face and it can recognize it. It says which person it was or if two uh, faces match. So you could basically say, why are you doing applied research projects on things that you can just read in papers and then implement? I mean, Google has a stuff on GitHub, you can use it. Um, and it turns out, yeah, face matching is part of the whole architecture. It's a convolutional neural network that Google built, and here we use a convolutional neural network uh, together with a fully convolutional neural network that scales up not just to one prediction, but predicts every pixel. Um, but it turns out the face matching is just a tiny part of a larger architecture. I'm not showing you here the IT server architecture of the, of the company. I'm showing you the architecture of a machine learning solution. Here's an ensemble of machine learning methods. Here is um, uh, another convolutional neural network, another one, an ensemble of deep learning methods, deep learning ensemble, analytics plus two deep learning models, in the end error handling and final result. What is, are all these models doing? Detection of the orientation of the image. Yeah, you could do it also with different methods, but you can do it with um, a deep learning ensemble. And then a large part, basically all this part, is trying to find out if the face that is smiling into the camera is actually a real face or if it is some replay attack from a computer, a phone, a printout, somebody wearing a mask. You know, this is in, in financial applications, so people might have some incentive to appear different than they are. So in such an application, we have to care for the system not just to be good in the way we describe it in papers. It has to be proven for reality. Let's make a quick test. Here are three examples that are, have been input to the system. I want you to show your hand if you believe this one is a real face sitting in front of the camera. Oh, okay, a third, almost half, okay. Who, is, who thinks this one is a guy sitting in front of the, a, f a guy sitting in front of the camera? Ah, you might be right, it's like a little bit blurry, and that could be a printout from a laser printer, a crappy far color laser printer. And this guy? Okay, by now you think I trick you, which I do. Turns out, this is a Retina Display iPad. All the anti-spoofing methods don't work with these, because it's too high resolution. Damn. This actually is a guy sitting in front of some other computer that also has a high resolution display and it's not from Apple. Still difficult. And this old 640 times 480 VGA camera stuff is the guy sitting in front of his laptop trying to get recognized. These are the kind of things we have to deal with in reality. And this is why face matching with this uh, poster name for the project is just a small part that has been done very quickly. And now we are working on these kind of problems. Let's quickly go to the next example before we come to the to conclusions from that. I want you to, to set the stage for, for what, we, what can we draw from this, what can we learn for your applications maybe. This is an example we do with a company from, from Bülach. They are producing machines that in the end produce medical products. In this case, balloon catheters that are in, uh, put into the body within surgeries and later pulled out hopefully. And what we are trying to build is a machine. No, we are not building the machine. The company is building a machine that can take pictures of the final products. And we are building an algorithm that wants to do quality control, like analyzing the picture and says, this is a good balloon catheter, or this is a bad one. It has bubbles, scratches. It, it can rupture within the body, what might be fatal. So we want to detect this automatically to, to ensure quality production. Um, what are the challenges in this kind of product? You could say this is just image recognition, yeah? It's, this is what deep learning is good at. We all know this since 2012. We heard it in the morning. Um, so why is that a research project? First thing is, these are example images, what we are dealing with here. You probably spot the difference to what we have in, in all the examples that are famous now in ImageNet. These are not natural images. This is some technical whatever images with different lighting, completely non-natural stuff, uh, transparent uh, surfaces, whatever. We completely have to focus on other stuff, meaning we cannot just take a pre-trained network from ImageNet, apply it, and it will work. Actually, we did that just for fun. Zero percent recognition. <laughs> Zero. Nothing. So you have to do some more tricks. 
We also have class imbalance. Of course, we have much more balloons that are okay compared to less that are defect. Otherwise, a business would probably not be a good business. And um, we have a lot of variation in defects. We have very, very tiny ones. Uh, you see it here. You have long scratches. This is not a scratch, but we can imagine it would be a scratch. Um, large variation in size of the defects. Most of them are very small, but some are really big. This is percentage of the whole image. Some are 10% of the image, some are, most are very, very small. So, meaning you have to, to think about how do you train the thing. Um, it turns out what in the end is important is um, not just to feed complete images and also not to rescale the images because it actually is important in which orientation um, the defects are. So, um, we played a little bit with these kind of things, put uh, also a weighting scheme on the different loss terms in the, in, the, in the training procedure into account and some secret sauce that we are not, not about to tell at the moment. And it turns out we are coming closer to our target of having a really high recall rate. Um, sorry, really, really high recall rate, yes, and uh, okay precision. We are coming close to it. We are not yet there, but we come close to it. A side note, we heard this morning in the keynote how important it is for models to be somehow interpretable, to get a feeling as a human when we start to trust these stuff, how does it do it? And sometimes there's a notion of deep learning methods being a black box and being difficult to interpret, and they are difficult to interpret and we still have to make progress. But there are methods around that really go in this direction. At the moment, I would say most of funding flows into this river because it's really important and some solutions are around. Um, one we use frequently are feature response maps that basically show for here we have the original image, it's a defect image, and here we show where the neural network is looking at. Here is a defect, the professional annotator can see it. Um, it is recognized with 99.8% recognition rate, and here we have automatically visualized where did the neural network focus on to come to that conclusion. And we see Good match. We would not be as happy with a high recognition rate if it would look at the corners. So this works pretty well in, in, in certain circumstances. It can even be um, a vaccine against these kinds of attacks we saw in the morning where the school bus appears as an ostrich. Um, interesting side note. Let's quickly go to a third example. Music scanning. We're working together with a, a startup company from, from the area that has the vision to take the burden off of musicians having to handle these huge piles of printed sheet music. If you play in an orchestra and you bring all your notes and you put it in front of, of yourself to play and then wind comes and it falls down and, and your, the coffee stains somehow overlay the, the, the notes, that's bad. We are in a digital age, we could do that with a giant iPad for example, but for that we need more than just taking a picture of the score and putting it on the iPad, we need scores that are machine readable. Just like we want the computer to, um, if we display text, to be machine readable so, so we can zoom in or do uh, uh, spell correction, all these kind of things that computers are good at. For music notes, that might be that I'm the conductor and you're the uh, orchestra and I say, okay, let's start over in measure number 768. You all would start going through your papers, a triangle only has three pages and the violin has 20 of them, I can just press on my iPad and say measure 768 and bam, all your different scores will turn to the same page. These are the kind of things that are possible with the system. What do we need for it? We need a way to turn an image into a machine readable form. So we need scanning software. Not for text, for musical notes. That's an interesting computer vision problem. Um, this is a, music, a page of musical symbols with red uh, a square centered on every symbol we want to detect. Now we come to the challenges. This is, scale is, is correct, so we see the difference in size. These are typical examples from state-of-the-art computer vision data sets for object detection. You see our pages with musical objects are way larger, way, way, way larger, need bigger neural networks. And here we see, for example, on this image, two objects to be recognized. They have need roughly a third of the, of the space of the whole image and we have two objects in the whole image. These kind of pages, some objects have one pixel in size, 
and we have literally hundreds of them per page on average, up to a couple of thousands. If we try the standard computer vision methods that currently win all the competitions, <coughs> doesn't work at all. We have some more challenges. For example, musical symbols change their identity, so to say, depending on context. Who plays an instrument here? I try a little bit on guitar, so I'm not with notes, it's not mine, but I heard that this dot is a staccato dot. Uh, sorry, sorry, this dot is a staccato dot. And this is a dot that prolongs the duration of the note. So depending on if it is over the note or just next to it, it means to play a little longer or it means to play very to the point. Same here with uh, the, 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 the sharp symbol. has a different meaning at the beginning of, of a line than uh, directly in front of a note. This affects all notes following. So the context plays a role. We cannot just put a detector over the symbol and detect it in isolation. Very problematic. Next thing, class imbalance. Um, very imbalanced data set. We have that actually in every project we, talk, uh, we, we, we have. This thing, note hat black, makes out 50% of all our symbols and we have created and published the largest computer vision data set in the world uh, in February. I'm not sure if it's now superseded by something else, but in February it was the largest computer annotated computer vision data set in the world. 50% uh, of the symbols, this note hat. It goes until here, where we have still reasonable resemblance in the data set. All the rest, you cannot read it here, but these are the numbers, how frequent they are. This symbol, in the data set only three times, in the largest data set in the world. And we have really created a huge one. So how do you cope with this in a, in, a, in a deep learning model, in a convolutional architecture? Turns out we took some standard ingredients, uh, a big ResNet, you can think of it as a convolutional neural network that can be more deep, another block after it, uh, some fully connected layers. We have three different outputs. Um, I won't go too much into the details how the architecture works. If you want, you find details in the paper. Um, the interesting thing is, we trained it for the first time. We were really happy it worked on our synthesized scores. Then, for, just for fun, we retrained a little bit on a public data set of handwritten scores. And our pro to our project partner, we said, this will never work. It's, this is out of scope. Maybe in the uh, uh, second follow-up project we take. Uh, care for for handwritten. Turns out it works equally well on handwritten. Why? Because the deep learning stuff is really capable in learning abstractions and on that abstract re representation, this is how I think it works, handwritten notes are not so difficult, uh, so different from, from, the, from the printed scores. So this is our stage. These are the projects, these are the challenges we face there. Let's turn to some lessons learned. Ah, no, we have, sorry, <laughs> we have absolutely recent and not yet published results um, that Ismail created, I, know, I think just this week. Um, I told you, let's go back, we trained on synthesized scores because if you want to have the largest, need the largest data set in the world, you cannot just scan and annotate by hand. This will take more resources than we have at ZRV. So we have a synthesized data set, but in the end it should work in the real world with notes that are pictured with the iPhone, that are scanned, that have coffee stains on it, people have written something onto it, stuff like that maybe. Re at least real scans. So we wanted two things to industrialize our thing that already worked well in research and we wrote papers on it. We want to work not just on synthesized scores, but on scans with all the illumination problems, the papers, not completely flat, stuff like that. And we wanted to cope with the class imbalance. What did we do? We trained on our, for, for this part, for the robustness to, to real world data, we trained on our synthesized data set and we retrained a little bit on pages from our data set that we sent to the printer, scanned in again, and used an automatic procedure to basically copy the ground truth from our label data set to the, to, the uh, to, the, to the real one. Turns out, works pretty well. Now we can also handle scans. Not yet perfectly, we're working on it, groundbreaking result just from this week, but we are 
really happy it will work really well in a, in a couple of weeks. The other thing with uh, class imbalance, with all these symbols that only occur very infrequently, we said, okay, a page of music, is there any other page? Mm -hmm. A page of music, like a page of text, usually has margins that are free at the side and top bottom. We decided let's put crops of rare symbols everywhere in the margins of the usual standard normal pages. Don't care for any alignment, just square patches of rare symbols so that on average our classifier while training sees every symbol, what is it, I think every tenth page at least. In expectation, in expectation every tenth page instead of every 300,000th page or something like that. Turns out works really well. These simple tricks, but tricks you maybe wouldn't use if it would just be for the sake of writing a paper, improved our mean average precision, the standard measure you're using when you're doing object detection, uh, from 16% in the beginning, that was a number we published in a respectable scientific conference, to at the moment 33%. But these are the things we did because it's an industrial project with an industrial partner to somehow boost the performance and we are still not done there. It's work in progress. I think it will still improve a little. Good. Lessons learned from that. I have four pages for lessons learned and roughly five minutes. Let's see. We did so far, I don't know, a handful, two handful of projects with deep learning on real use cases. What can we take out of it? The first and very basic and simple messages that data is important. And it's, it's so simple that it should be forbidden to talk about it, but it somehow it seems necessary. I think all our projects started with high expectations and no data, and it took longer than we thought until the data arrived. Sometimes because we self said we will take care for it. For the music project, uh, one of my colleagues was working a year full time on synthesizing this huge data set and creating the annotation as well. Uh, for it. For another project, this one with the balloon cathedrals, it, it took the business partner longer than, than, than we all thought to create a setup where he can collect the data and annot annotations in a way that it is useful. Um, and it turned out, while the business partner was doing it for the balloon cathedrals, that understanding was an important part. This part of understanding. Turned out we did several sessions of training, not just with the person's like the, the, the technical persons later operating our system, uh, retraining like the, the technical guys, but also with the business people who had the know-how of what is a scratch and don't know the first thing of computer science. We had several training sessions with them, explaining them how deep learning works, what our methodology does, how it is looking at images, if you allow the term looking, that is somehow a human term and not so appropriate for, for, for a technical system, anyhow. Um, we trained them so that they understood what does our method do so they knew on what kind of thing they have to look when they annotate our data. Because if we didn't do that, they would assume that an AI is somehow smarter as we, which it is not, and annotate data in a way like, ah, oh, the, the, the network will know that. Like when it, I annotated the, the error on one image and then I rotate by 15 degrees and the same error is now a little bit shifted, the system will automatically know it. No, why should it automatically know it if we don't provide training data for that? We had to train them on the methodology, give them research knowledge so that they can annotate the right way. Good. Um, another thing what we learned is very important. We cannot just advance the state of the art in the detection methods. We have to also to work on methods that somehow make it graspable what is learned and how decisions are taken. Example here, while we were waiting on the balloon data, we worked a little bit on, on medical data here on x-ray images to classify if there's something wrong on that image or everything is in biological order. You see here some screws in that shoulder and we classified it as here's something wrong and it highlighted, it looked at the screws and metal plates. So this is also a relief. I think my colleague who's currently working on it is at the moment ranked 10 on the international competition on classifying uh, the, the x-ray images by Stanford. Good. So data is important, understanding is important, things we already heard in the morning. Um, what else is important? Having simple baselines. 
We're doing applied research projects. Of course, we have an interest in doing things that advance the state of the art, that are somehow advanced. But what we see time and time again is that it's important to start simple. Simple does not only mean, I don't know, linear regression. It can also mean have a simple neural network. Uh, we say a vanilla network, a, a simple, not too deep one, and see what works with this. Maybe even starting on a simpl simplified case, simpler data, and work on from there, see what are the real challenges we have to, we have to uh, take care of in the end. Um, good places to start, here, here it becomes really practical, is a model zoo, where you find pre-trained models, where you find different architectures, even things you maybe not know completely in detail, but you can go to this page, download models, start from there, and pages where you can find public data sets and good annotations, like this is a page for the X-ray images from Stanford. Um, what else is important? Um, when you're doing a machine learning course somewhere online or at a university, you get tortured by things like cross entropy and, and all these standard loss functions after a while you know them. And because this is all you have seen in your courses, you think this is the way to go. What we realized in all these projects, we have more difficult architectures in the models that not only do classification, but classification and detection or classify different things with different output heads, we call it different, different outputs. And so we have loss functions that, that are not just a standard loss functions, but really engineered. In deep learning, you say the machine can do everything. It starts from, uh, from, from pixels, from raw input, and it can come up with the features itself. That's completely true. The engineering shifted away from doing feature engineering to caring for the architecture and shaping the target of the learning so it learns a useful thing. It turned out in the, on, for, for great results we, are, um, we really like on the music data set, um, we had even to shape the, the order of training steps. We have three output heads. It turned out we cannot just train on all three of them. We start with one. Then it gets, at some point it gets worse on the second one, so we stop training on the first, iterate on the second, and only in the end fine tune on all three of them uh, in order to, to get a good result. So we, we really have to have an eye on the training process. It, this is not magic, but this is where, where the experience and the knowledge of, of the methodology comes in. Um, same with, with, with model architecture and, and what to put into it. It's important to have an understanding of the, of the business problem of the data in terms of the balloon catheters. It was important to know scratches in the long direction of the catheter are not, not so, so, so important because it may burst, but it stays in one piece. You can take it out and put another one in. But in the diagonal way, if it bursts, you have two pieces. One is connected to what you can draw out. The other one will stay in your heart, in your brain, wherever the catheter is. Bad thing. So the same error from our point of view, vision-based, that looks exactly the same if it's in that direction, fatal, in that marked as error, in that direction, not so important, not marked as error. Informed us that we cannot do data augmentation by rotating 90 degrees. Good. Last thing, deployment usually omitted in scientific papers, but important. If you put the things in practice, we often care about, here I circled the face matching part, the core part, what we wanted to care for in the project turned out. We have to care for lots of other things, other models that help solving the, the big picture problem. Turns out building Specific solutions for specific sub-problems is really helpful in business when you're caring for really optimizing the thing for performance. Turns out ensembles are not an old idea before we knew deep learning. By the way, deep learning goes back to neural networks, which were very right from the beginning in, uh, in AI part of the whole field, so it's not so new. Anyway, ensembles are still important, even in deep learning, and a very good idea to do. Um, the whole architecture of the thing you deploy in business will be more than just the one neural network that you thought of in the beginning. So, my four conclusions. Deep learning is applied. It's not just a research topic. It's a topic that really can help. Not for everything, but if you have a pattern recognition problem, that's a very good idea to, to, to look into deep learning. Um, it does not necessarily mean big data in the sense of you have to be a big internet company with terabytes of stuff. 
Um, we did a newspaper segmentation uh, application that is applied by a company in Zurich with 500 labeled images. But, but you need some data, and it depends a little bit on the case, what kind of data and how much. Um, training can be tricky. You really have to have your training process uh, under control, and that needs most of the time after you fiddle with your data and have that. And latest good news, uh, for we have new theory. We have, not we, the community has new theory, new ways of getting a feeling for what is a method learning, what is it doing that really helps us opening the black box. So I would oppose the saying of it's a, still a black box, deep learning and trained models. We, it, it takes time, it's difficult, but we can see what is going on to, some, to degrees where it is really helpful and enables more trust. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dino. I think.